Okay, I think we can we can start. Um, so let me introduce myself. I'm, uh, my name is Michal. I'm a software engineer working for uh, Google in the GKE Batch team. And today I'm going to co-present with Vanossa from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, uh, who unfortunately cannot be uh, with me on the stage, but um, I will play her part and she will be later for your questions on the Slack. Uh, so let me begin um, with um, a little bit of history, like all of you know, like Kubernetes was built originally with, um, with the focus on long running and stateless applications. And naturally there was a lot of uh, feature gaps in the early um, job API to run batch workloads. And, uh, but over the years, uh, uh, users who wanted to use Batch uh, were still very determined to run Batch on uh, Kubernetes, um, even at the cost of workarounds of, or re-implementing features which should have been provided by the uh, core Kubernetes. Um, but this leads to a lot of fragmentation in the, in the ecosystem of Batch. So um, we would like to improve this situation and reduce the fragmentation. So that's why we started the Batch Working Group initiative, and we work under its umbrella to bring all the necessary features and primitives to the core uh, Kubernetes. So we believe that this will improve workload portability between uh, different frameworks and between different cloud providers. And also this will um, allow framework developers to focus on the value added rather than uh, re-implementation of the core functionality. Okay, so let's take a look uh, at what has been done on that front. Uh, so here you can see uh, on the left the list of problems and on the right the list of uh, new features that address these problems in the recent releases of Kubernetes. So the list encompasses many uh, areas. You can see, for example, improved uh, handling of periodic jobs or the uh, job suspend field, uh, which is a stepping stone for job queuing, something that uh, Aldo talked at length. Um, but in this talk, I would like to focus on two features, uh, that is index job and pod failure policy. Um, so let me first introduce index job um, by the use case of processing a large data set. So if we have a large data set, we naturally want to split it into smaller chunks and process the data set in um, parallel by multiple workers in the world of Kubernetes represented by pods. Um, but the problem in the early API and uh, like the recommended approach was to create and maintain your own queue of tasks. Uh, however, if the data set isn't changing, then we can do have a simpler solution and just assign um, the specific track of the data set based on the worker index. And this is essentially what the index job gives us. So we simply set the completion, completion mode uh, as shown in the YAML on the right uh, as indexed. And then the mm, uh, environment variable is in, with the index is injected into the worker process, which can be then used by the worker to load a specific chunk of the data set. To, so that makes it simple. And uh, also, if we add another requirement uh, that the pods need to communicate while, while processing the data set, mm, then uh, index job also makes it uh, simpler. Uh, because if you create the index job as shown on the left and then match it with the um, headless service as shown in, in the middle, in the YAML, then all the pods uh, will have the stable DNS names and predictable upfront. And so this, the DNS names will include the job name, the worker index, and the service name. And this makes it convenient to, um, to set up a distributed uh, network of pods. Um, and yeah, in the use cases as we are about to see. Um, okay, so uh, important part of the talk is to uh, I would like to present selection of uh, use cases where the index job feature finds its use uh, at DeepMind. And here I want to say big thanks to George and uh, Lena for sharing the insights. And uh, George should also be available on Slack uh, at the end of the session if you have some questions. So the use case, the first use case that I want to present is uh, we want to train a machine learning model 
and we want to train it on a large data set. Um, and in order to make the uh, training fast, we need to shard the data set across many devices while the devices are split between multiple nodes and each node also can have multiple devices um, um, inside. Uh, the devices are typically GPU or TPU. So let's take a look how index job can be helpful here. So in the first step, we create um, one uh, pod uh, per node. And here, um, one pod with the zero index is a distinguished pod called coordinator. Um, so because, as I said before, it has a stable DNS name, predictable upfront, then while creating the other pods, we can um, uh, make, it makes it easy so other pods register their presence at the, at the start of, uh, of the system. And then the coordinator can set up the distributed environment. So in particular, it will await for all the pods to be ready and all the communications channel to be established between the, the pods. Um, so what, once we have that, all the pods can load the uh, shard of the uh, big data set and split into, um, into smaller mini batches corresponding loaded on the particular devices. And along with the uh, data, we also load the model and here we on the devices, and we, here we have the simplifying assumption that the model can fin, fit into memory of a single device. And in practice, this is, might be more complex than in this uh, case. Uh, once we have that, uh, uh, the uh, devices train on the uh, loaded uh, mini batches of the data, and the communication channels are uh, used to exchange partial results of the training of the, on the smaller um, parts of chunks of the data set. So that once the results are exchanged, we uh, obtain a single model that is uh, trained on the entire data set. Um, if you are interested, then I would also uh, like to refer you to some code samples inspired by this use case uh, that I prepared both for uh, PyTorch and uh, JAX-ML libraries. Um, OK, so in the next use case, uh, we want to simulate an agent in a virtual reality or environment uh, for the purpose of reinforcement learning. So in this setup, the agent uh, performs different actions on the environment, and also it can observe the environment uh, to update its knowledge of the world. And for some achievements in the environment, it collects rewards. Um, so the assumption is that by correlating the actions with the um, rewards, we can make the new generation of the agent that is more likely to repeat the uh, actions that led to rewards. Uh, however, in practice, we don't want to run just a single simulation, but we want to run many. And the reasons include, for example, just that we want to collect more data so that we can make some of the less likely uh, trajectories uh, also to be explored. Uh, we also want to account for uh, like variation in the initial conditions, or we also want to test agent for um, with different uh, tendencies for exploration versus execution. Um, so again, let's take a look at uh, how we can set up this uh, with index job. So the assumption is that we have the agents and environments uh, containerized. Then. Mm, here we have two index jobs. One uh, will represent multiple players and the other multiple environments. Um, and then by using, again, the feature of stable and predictable DNS names, the agents can connect easily to the um, environment with the same index and uh, create a communication channel that will be used for, for the simulation. Um, so once we have that, uh, the simulation can start and uh, um, actions, observations, rewards can be passed uh, over the course of the simulation. And this is nicely abstracted out by the open source uh, library uh, by DeepMind. Uh, and if you are interested, I will also like to refer you to the uh, code samples that I uh, prepared for the simple uh, catch game. Uh, so what you can see on the GIF on the right is uh, an example trajectory in this game um, played for a single index. 
Okay, so I would like to conclude this part by saying that while you can think of many workarounds, and they will work to some extent, so this is also similar to um, what, was, what happened here. So prior to index job, DeepMind actually used stateful sets, um, but there were some problems with them. So one, um, I mean, the root cause was actually the lack of the notion of completion that is characteristic to all batch uh, workloads. And because of the lack of uh, the notion of completion, pods, um, so for example, in this use case of the simulation, some simulation can end earlier, but the pods would still continue running, consuming resources. And also you would need to have some custom code to detect when the simulation is over. And also there was no like um, mechanism, native mechanism to, um, to limit uh, the number of failures in case of a software bug, let's say. Um, so index jobs nicely, nicely fits uh, this, this use case. Um, okay, and now is uh, the second uh, part of the talk when I will, uh, Vanessa will play about, <laughs> I will play Vanessa's talk uh, when she talks about flux operator. Um, I will also make it clear that she will be, or already is even, at CNCF Slack channel. So if you think of some questions that you want to target to Vanessa or, or, or George, then um, you will you should be able to find them on Slack uh, after the session. Hi, fellow Kubernetes. I'm Vanessa Socket, and I'm going to be talking about an example use case for index jobs, a project called the Flux Operator that we've been working on at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Let's get started. Once upon a time, there was a resource manager named Flux Framework. And Flux lived in HPC land, along with the other resource managers, a few container technologies, and of course, a sysadmin or two. And Flux was really great at a lot of things that you see in this table, but especially Flux was great at full hierarchical and graph-based resource management. Oh, hi there, little friend. You have a question. What does graph-based resource management mean? That is a good question. So let's say that we have a resource allocation with four nodes. Doesn't matter if this is on HPC or on a Kubernetes cluster. We could theoretically install Flux and start what's called a Flux instance. Now the Flux instance can actually see the resources that are available to it. And then if we were to create a job, launch a job, the really cool part of that is that Flux is going to create instances of itself to run on the sub resources. And if you're looking at this and you're like, hmm, I don't know, this looks a little bit graphy, you are totally right, we're looking at different depths of a graph where each depth knows about and validates its own resources. So this means that Flux is really good at portability. You can run it on a cluster. You can run it alongside Luster. You can run it on a share. You can really run it like anywhere. <laughs> you can run it in a container using Flux as a total no-brainer. Flux is also really good at co-scheduling because it's able to know the node topology. So let's say that you have a workflow that requires GPUs to communicate. Flux can schedule them to be physically close together. Flux is also really good at jobs coordination. So here we have the Mumi workflow, and Mumi was incredibly heterogeneous in terms of the different needs for the workflow components. Flux was able to intelligently schedule them so that those components best match the resources they needed across a very large set of resources. Okay, so you know Flux is like hanging out over here in HPC land. And as you know over here, there's this out cloud land where we have technologies like Kubernetes. And in between them is the fog of war, if you've ever played like a, a strategy game. And in this fog of war, the idea is that there's something that needs to be uncovered and we need to go on a journey. And so last year in the lab, this is exactly what we decided to do. We said, onward to converge computing, the space between HPC and cloud. So in this space, one of the early projects to emerge is the Flux Operator. And this is going to be what I'm talking about today. Okay, let's get started on today's journey, starting with a stop at Definition Island. So probably most of you know what an operator is. It is a controller for a Kubernetes cluster to manage objects. So the Flux operator is a controller that allows us to set up that Flux instance to run across pods. And specifically this part here, we have a special term for it. We call it a mini cluster, and no, I don't mean a cluster for ants. 
I actually mean a set of duplicate pods created by the index job. Here is where the index job comes in. I need Kubernetes configured to run a Flux instance. And it's really cool conceptually because it's like you have an entire cluster in the cloud, an HPC cluster for you to control. So let's say that we start with a Kubernetes cluster of size nine. We could theoretically create a mini cluster also of size nine to maximally, maximally utilize our resources. And index zero of that, bro the, that job is called the broker, orchestrating the job. The way the pods communicate is via a tree-based overlay network. And it has kind of all the niceties that you'd expect, so batch jobs, queuing, et cetera. Okay, basic question, how do I submit a job? Well, if you come visit us in HPC land, we're gonna give you a command line thing. If you go off to cloud land, somebody's gonna hand you a YAML file. So to like start off, we figured, okay, we'll just define the needs of a job in a mini cluster.yaml file. This is our custom resource definition or CRD. So basically, you define your job in this file, you give it to the Flux offer, and it's going to create you a mini cluster, and then your job is going to complete, run, and everything cleans up. Yay, okay, I'm ready to make a mini cluster. The next stop in our journey is going to be to experiment empire, where we ask empirical questions like, how well does this work again? So we decided we wanted to compare it to the MPI operator, which is another operator in the space that is very similar in nature. This started as part of the Kubeflow project, defines an MPI job as its custom resource. It has a slightly different design. It uses a launcher node to coordinate workers via SSH. Like the Flux operator, it also uses a dedicated host name and a service for workers. And we had to use a modified version to scale to over 100 MPI ranks. Check out the paper right there if you want to learn more about that. Okay. So like, how do they compare? So we decided to run an experiment that looked at LAMPs, a molecular simulation on an unoptimized containers. This is what that experiment looked like. So we needed to use a 65 node cluster to account for that extra launcher node, but then we want to test on sizes basically 64 down to eight of a mini cluster or just sort of an index job. And you can also see the corresponding number of ranks, which are the MPI processes. Okay, so we're gonna create that cluster. And then for each of the operators, we're going to launch a job or create the mini cluster across each of those different sizes. We're gonna record timings and we're going to save the outputs. Ah, show me the results. Apparently our sun god at the empirical experiment island is angry. Right away, sun god, do the results. Okay, sun god has questions. If the flux operator mini cluster is created via an index job, how well does that scale? Well, here you're looking at mini cluster creation and deletion times. So this includes the entire bringing up and then bringing down of the pods, but does not include lamps. And as we move across the x-axis, we move from size eight to size 64, so the cluster gets bigger. And the really cool part is that this scales really nicely, like the index job is doing a great job. Okay, so next question from the Sun God. If the Flux and MPI operator have different designs, like how efficient is each operator set up? So because we are comparing apples and oranges here, we need to look at them separately. Starting with the MPI operator, here's the end-to-end -end time. So this is the notification of the job through the timestamp when it's completed. This, I must note, is when the pods are ready to go. There's absolutely no waiting for pods here. And it does not include the lamps run. And what you see is that there's a twofold increase in time from size eight to size 64. Now the similar thing we could compare to in Flux is a Flux start. This is from like when the broker comes to life through when he shuts down or when it shuts down. So this, I need to point out that this includes the broker waiting for all the other pods. We don't know when the broker is going to come up relative to the other pods. It also does not include the lamps run. And it looks pretty okay to me. Okay, so when you remove the setup, Let's compare finally apples to apples. How do the run times of these things compare? So specifically, we're going to look at flux submit versus MPI run. This is like if you logged into an HPC center and you like wanted to run this with flux directly or with MPI run, that's the command you would type. And this does include the lamps run. This is like the direct wrapper to lamps as close as we can get without being inside lamps. And I want to point out that for these experiments, so we can't really generalize to like everything, but for these experiments, we did note that the flux operator is consistently faster. We think it might be related to the bootstrap or other MPI variables, but the difference is like 
really insignificant. Okay, so when we peel back another layer of the onion and we look just at the lamps time reported by lamps, so, so no wrappers, we again see the differences get even smaller. <laughs> but if you kind of visually look at the medians, they're about 10% lower for flux. And we think that like for larger workflows, this could potentially translate to cost savings. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that the index job does allow the mini cluster pods to scale really nicely. Very happy about that. We think that Flux's zero MQ bootstrap might be related to why it's a little bit faster because the MPI operator uses an SSH-based bootstrap. More work, of course, is needed to investigate the performance. Like, folks, lamps is not it. And this might be the most important point of the entire talk, so listen up. The architecture of the Flux operator allows for multiple jobs to be run on the mini cluster, so we avoid the infamous etcd API server bottlenecks, and it enables high throughput. And finally, we want to point out that the MPI operator does require that extra laundry node, and it could also benefit from using an index job. They seem pretty great to me. <laughs> Already, we've learned so much at the experiment empire. The Flux operator has promised. Yay! <laughs> but... I have some questions, I hope you do too. We need to take a quick stop at the Reality Republic. So this question, how do I submit a job? Did you really think to run these experiments we applied like a YAML file like a thousand times? Do you think that's how I wanna spend my workday? Absolutely not. We actually ran these experiments using a tool called Flux Cloud. In Flux Cloud, you define your experiments in a YAML file. Yeah, I know, we can't escape the YAML, it's everywhere, so we still use it here. And then there's just three commands, so up, apply, and down to bring everything up, run your experiments, and then bring everything down. So you can kind of like watch, work on other things, watch your containers, logs, and have a sandwich, have an avocado. It's super easy. And then when you're done, all of your config files, data, and output are saved for reproducibility. Oh, everyone, take a breath. Our vision for converged computing is not applying a billion YAML files. It is a comfortable, intuitive user interface. Okay, so one really awesome thing about being in Reality Republic is we know that reality is informed by vision. So as we're here, let's take a ride on the visionary vehicle we're going to jump on and ask this question, how could we submit jobs? So I played a fiendish trick on you. I didn't tell you that if you don't give a command to the Flux operator mini cluster CRD, the Flux operator will actually bring up an interactive interface for you to submit jobs, for you to monitor your jobs in a table, or check output logs. And it also serves a RESTful API that can be interacted with via SDK. And so that is closer to our vision for this future of converged computing. And we also are thinking about some of these other things coming soon to a theater or Kubernetes cluster <laughs> near you. So keep the watch out. Alrighty, we're coming in for a landing on the visionary vehicle and we plop down in the collaboration coast and we're met by our friends. Yay. And so one point I really want to impress is that in order to make progress in this converged computing space, it is absolutely essential that we work together and share our ideas. And to kick us off on that thread, I'm going to share with you some of the design tips that I learned when designing the Flux operator. Okay, problem. I have a resource manager that communicates via a network. Solution. You can use an index job as plus a headless service as a nice solution with fully qualified domain names. Problem, I need specialized logic to generate something. You, you could run it via an entry point. If it's just like a one-time thing, you can create an isolated pod to run before the index job and run it that way, or you could use init containers. Problem, my workers are specialized. They are, they're, they're, not, they're special snowflakes and I can't use the index job. Okay. You can use logic that distinguishes based on the index. This is exactly what we do for the broker. And a cool suggestion is maybe the jobs API could allow us to define groups with custom logic. Good work. Problem, I need multi-tenancy. So, okay, so I don't have a great solution for this one, but what we're doing is we're starting the container as root, getting everything set up, and then we're actually running the jobs as a user. So this is just the start of mapping out this converged computing space. What's so exciting is that there's more projects to be discovered and worked on, and we need your help 
we want you to get involved. So please come and find us on GitHub under Flux Framework. The operator project is also there too. Flux Cloud is under the Converge Computing Organization. And to learn more about Flux, check out fluxframework.org. And that is how to reach me or any of my clones here apparently <laughs> via email. And I'm VSOC on all the social media places. Thank you to these cloud providers for supporting us in our adventures. And thank you for having me at KubeCon. I had a blast. Miha, back to you. Thank you, Vanessa. Hold on, hold on. I mean, yes. But we, uh, there is one more part of the talk. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I would also like to uh, present the pod failure policy, which is the recent uh, feature in Job Controller, currently in beta. So if you have some ideas, suggestions, uh, then also we will welcome uh, your input. So let me uh, introduce it by, uh, again, the use case. Uh, so here we want to run a batch workload, uh, large, comprising hundreds or thousands of, uh, of pods. And when running such a workload, many things can go wrong. wrong. Uh, like pods are pretty much ephemeral. So the nodes can go down, um, or there might be a higher priority workload that would uh, evict your pods. So uh, to some extent, and this was uh, already addressed in the early job API by the back of limit, where you could specify the number of retries. However, we, uh, it, in many use cases, like this one, it is uh, really not sufficient, because there is a trade-off when setting it up. So if you set the back of limit to low, then you risk that you fail the job in case of disruptions, such as node going down and so on. But if you, on the other hand, set the back of limit to high, then you, in case of a software bug, uh, risk like many unnecessary retries of uh, the pod in case of software bugs that translates into costs. Uh, okay, so it sounds simple. What we would like to do ideally is to just retry for free in case of disruption or uh, terminate the, or fail the entire job in case uh, we fa the pod failed due to a software bug. But uh, how to tell a difference? So one strategy you can think of, and this strategy was implemented by a couple of frameworks, including TensorFlow job in Kubeflow, is to use exit codes. So that's natural. We have it in status, etc. But the problem is that it's not a full solution again, because the, some of the exit codes, like 137 for seek kill, are ambiguous. So this exit code would be set both in case of disruptions, because your graceful node shut down, node was going down. Uh, but it will also be set in if your pod has a memory leak and exceeded memory limits and uh, was umkilled. So th the solution that we propose is based on the um, pod conditions in combination with exit codes, actually. So pod conditions are uh, like in status, you have a list of uh, conditions. And um, as uh, an important part, so here is an example, was an example of the pod condition, but as an important part of this uh, effort, we reviewed uh, places in the co core code of Kubernetes which evict a pod, classified which of them correspond to uh, disruptions, and we modified the places of the core Kubernetes to add the condition that uh, indicates that the pod was disrupted um, and the name of the condition is then disruption target. So let's take a look. So first of all, such a pod could be disrupted by uh, the control plane components. So uh, for example, uh, by scheduler in case of preemption by a higher priority workload. Another, there are a couple of cases, but also we modified the code of uh, kubelet in some scenarios, like for example, graceful node shutdown due to rest, node restart. Um, but we are aware that this doesn't cover all the cases. There might be some uh, third-party controllers that have their own reasons for evicting a pod, etc. So like a core um, part of the design is to allow custom conditions that then users can use in the pod failure policy to handle a failed pod. Um, also, there is a related work for uh, bringing in more um, built-in conditions, but that's ongoing. Um, so let's take a look at an example, at example uh, pod failure policy. So pod failure policy is just a list of rules. 
and each rule specifies an action of how to handle a failed how to handle a failed pod in case of a match. And the match is again based on exit codes or pod conditions. So in the first rule here, the user wants to fail the entire job um, in case of configuration issues. And the configuration issues are uh, annotated by the custom config issue um, condition that is added in case of like unreservable container image or uh, invalid config map configuration. In the second rule, the user wants to just ignore and restart for free pod that failed due to disruptions. And for this purpose, the built-in disruption target condition is used. And in the next two rules, the user just wants to mimic the convention of handling failed pods by TF job that is based on the exit codes. Okay, here I will also want to thank, say big thanks to uh, folks from Rescale, who uh, also were nice enough to uh, share with us the results of the testing of the pod failure policy. So in their setup, they had also large, uh, embarrassingly parallel jobs. And they faced a very similar problem with just inflexibility of setting the back of limit. But with the uh, use of pod failure policy and uh, like in the SIAML, they are able to uh, prevent job failures while keeping the uh, time much shorter. Okay, so in summary, what we, what we uh, went through today, we uh, learned about the index job use cases, like uh, for machine learning, uh, for reinforcement learning, or setting up HPC environment that Vanessa talked about, flux operator. Uh, there are ex code examples uh, that uh, for the use cases, uh, inspired by the use cases, which I uh, like you to take a look at, and also you can take a look at the flux operator code. Um, and finally, we looked at the new feature of interest that is pod failure policy, but the list of new features is, uh, doesn't end here. So there is a lot of things uh, and new features that we are currently working on, just to name some elastic uh, index job or job set. So if you want to um, get involved and uh, participate in the discussions, uh, then batch working group is the good place to, uh, to come in. Um, I would also like to recommend you to watch once available the Swati and uh, Aldo talk about uh, batch working group. But essentially, if you have any topic related to watch um, or you want to present something, discuss, ask, then um, come and join. And with that, uh, I'm ready for questions. And there will also be Vanessa and George uh, um, ready for your questions on Slack. So thank you.